Now, I don't usually start a service uh, with this, but uh, just in case you're not familiar with Daniel chapter seven, it might be worth thinking about if you have children listening uh, and viewing whether you want them in for, for, the, for the remainder of, of this part of the service um, as we look at Daniel seven today. I'll leave that up to you. That, that could be your decision, but uh, unusually to start a service with a sort of uh, viewer warning, but um, there is some content that uh, you, you might not be entirely, uh, entirely happy with uh, if, if there's young children viewing. So I wonder if you've ever played that game. You know where you have to decide what animal you'd be if you were an animal? Have you ever played that game perhaps? Or sometimes you play it with a, a group of people and other people have to decide what animal best captures your character. Well, uh, reaching for the fictional Winnie the Pooh character, my daughter Mary once described me, she said this of me, she said, you're like Tigger, but less fluffy and just more annoying. I thought, well, I can't argue with that. That's about right, isn't it? Just uh, to be clear, we weren't actually playing the game at the time. I didn't invite that. Uh, that was her assessment on the basis of my behaviour in the car on the way back from the school run. And that's what she concluded. What animal captures your character? What about if you were to try uh, this game for a culture, for a government, a power in the world today? What if you were to, to have to come up with an animal that would capture the powers in play in our world today? It might be helpful not just, just to think of, of geographical, but maybe ideological. Well, I wonder, what would you come up? How, how did it look? How did it behave? What creature would capture the powers in play in our world? Imagine for a moment you're having a party. I know that is a crazy idea, but just imagine you had some people in your house and you were having a dinner party and you're playing this game with your guests. Oh, I describe China as a meerkat, says Jane. No, 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 more of a fox, I reckon, says John. But what about Putin? What about our woke generation and woke values, says Simon? But what if God was at your dinner party? I know, even more crazy idea, but imagine God was at your dinner party. And God chimes in with this. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had 10 horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Thank you very much, Joe. So the opening verses of chapter 7 of, da uh, of Daniel, God's answer to that question. Ask God to play the game. Ask God to give us a description of human powers in play in our world. And verses one to eight of Daniel seven would be his answer. A terrifying beast crushing and trampling, devouring its victims, 10 horns and one little horn with human eyes and an arrogant mouth on it. OK, then that would put a bit of a damper, wouldn't it, on your dinner party, the fun of game 
Just uh, firstly, perhaps a word or two about this kind of writing in the Bible. If you're new to Christian things or just exploring, it would be very easy to be put off by this. Let me let me be perfectly honest with you and say until my study this week, I've never really got my head around this kind of writing. In my mind, it's all a, a little bit weird. The, the kind of stuff that weirdos on the internet love. You know, you won't have to Google for long to find some crazy predictions of the future on the basis of this text. It's a type or genre of biblical writing called apocalyptic. Even the name of the genre sounds scary, doesn't it? Used for, for movies with that kind of title. It's weird imagery just made no sense to me. I think I'd say I just didn't like it. Perhaps you're thinking the same. Maybe if, if you're a gamer, you're more familiar with these kinds of images. But otherwise, I think it's OK if you find it a bit disturbing, a bit weird. If you find yourself asking, well, when can I just get back to a nice letter to the Romans or the Corinthians in the New Testament? That's understandable. You are actually in good company. Here's the great reformer, Martin Luther, on, uh, on, on the writers of this apocalyptic literature. He says this. They have a queer, in the original sort of way of meaning, they have a queer way of talking, like people who, instead of proceeding in an orderly manner, ramble off from one thing to the next. So you cannot make head or tail of them or see what they're getting at. When I, when I was at Bible college, I chose a course on the book of Revelation, another book in this genre of, of scripture. And part of the course was that for the entire semester, we were required to read Revelation right through every single day. And I did that. Still didn't like it. I still didn't get it. But the problem, of course, is never scripture. It's not God's word that's the problem, but rather it's my understanding, my or your finite and feeble mind. But this week, friends, it has grown on me. In fact, I'd say... I can see its worth. I can see what a brilliant way of describing something this can be. I concluded that one of you somewhere has been praying for me this week. So thank you very much for that. Certainly, this imagery is meant to be scary. No sense that this dream gives the idea that the powers in play in our world are things to live comfortably with. In a moment, I'm going to ask Joe to read the interpretation of this imagery that comes later in the chapter. We see that these monsters to that dinner party question. One commentator writes this, he wants to scare you. He wants to, for you to register terror as you see the gross and frightful creatures. He seems to be teaching us something about the overall pattern of history. He's certainly not blabbering blithely about progress in history. Davis is referring, of course, to the mantra of the, the secular ideologies which dominate our culture. Atheistic humanism, for example, loves to see history, human history, as progress. See, the key here is not to take the imagery literally. We must process them in a literary, not a literal way. It's helpful to remember it's vision, not video, or imagery, not IMAX, dream, not documentary. You get the idea. So if we will embrace that this is giving you and me a picture of human history, well, it is no picnic, is it? Kingdoms are out for conflict, control, conquest, domination, devouring no matter how many people they mangle or how much misery they inflict. Let, that's the headline. So let's see this in the text. Joe is now going to read to us the next, well, verses 15 to, to 25. What? I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying, with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the victim that crushed and devoured its victims 
and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favour of the saints of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave them this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will rise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times and half a time. Thank you again, Joe. So let's dive in straight away uh, into this and let's look at verse one. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was laying in his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. So first, we get when this took place. It's not in the chronological sequence of the first six chapters. We're back in the first year of Belshazzar, the king. And it's a vision. Chapter seven tells us that a structural shift in the book is taking place. We're moving from the familiar court scenes we've had with the kings in Babylon to visions. Visions that will ultimately reveal how God's people will get out of Babylon. See, chapter seven isn't saying, hey, look, I'm difficult to understand. It's just saying, look, the format is changing from here on in. And we've, we've had dreams before in Daniel and we, we've had interpretations. That is not new. But this one is Daniel's and he's not the one interpreting it. Before Daniel interpreted God's word for others. In other words, the audience wasn't Daniel, was it? Now God is talking to Daniel. He is the audience. In other words, the remainder of the book is God's message for his own people, not the Babylonians, but the Israelites. So first then, the four winds and the sea, then the four beasts. Generally, the Bible uses water like this to represent a place of chaos, the place where evil rules. Given that, as we've seen before, it's telling us God is stirring up the deep and controlling the very things that are actively in opposition to him. Now, that's nothing new, is it? We've seen that before in, in chapters one to six. God is always sovereign. The four winds, again, just representing all directions. In other words, total, i.e. nothing that Thomas Schnaffernacker would ever describe. And if he did, we'd be quite worried, wouldn't we? The beasts, we're told, represent four human kingdoms or powers. Just Let's just read verse 17. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise the earth. Now, not a lot is actually said about the first three. There's lots about the last, and we'll come back to that. But there are clues in the chapters, the first chapters of the book. Beast number one, a lion with eagle's wings. The lion, of course, the gold standard for kingly beasts. Nebuchadnezzar gets likened to a lion in lots of places in the Bible. Jeremiah, for example. And remember, Nebs had a time when he grew feathers and was then restored the wings on the lion eagles and then they were gone and he stood up on two feet like a man seems this beast is most likely babylon next up we get a bear ravaging and one side raised up above the other the kingdom that replaced babylon as the world power was the medo persian empire Potentially, the raised up element is the divisions in this empire. Some other scholars split the two and the bear is the Medes and the monster number two, uh, monster number three is the Persians. But by and large, the leopard is thought to be the Greeks that followed the Medo-Persian empire. 
The leopard has four wings and four heads. Gives the idea of agility, perhaps, like a dragonfly. Four heads to point to the four regions of the Greek Empire after Alexander the Great's death and, and the civil wars that ensued. But it's actually Beast 4, isn't it, that gets the most attention. Let's read those verses again. After that, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them. Picking up at 23, he gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saint, saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. Beast one, Babylon. Beast two, Medo-Persian, beast three, Greek, and usually beast four will be identified as the Roman Empire, as historically that's what followed the Greek. That's the most natural assumption from a post-Daniel perspective. But did you notice that the writer emphasizes over and over that this kingdom is different from the others? Bends over backwards to say you can't categorize this fourth beast so easily. Sure, all the beasts are different, but this final one in a class of its own. So if we were to play Daniel Top Trumps, Beast 4 beats all the others in every category. Viciousness gets a 10. Domination gets a 10. The funny little horn seems to be like no, none of the other horns that, that have gone before it. Seems to be saying this fourth empire to be established on Earth will be a truly universal emp empire makes everything that's gone before it look pathetic, insignificant. It's a power that conquers every other world power, a power without parallel in its domination and its ruthlessness. Here's Dal Ralph Davies again. I would prefer then simply to dub the fourth beast the different kingdom and understand it as the last human kingdom, the one in which human evil and rebellion will reach its apex. I think he's right, isn't he? Ask God what sort of animal would he use to describe the human power in play in our world today? And there you are, you have your answer. Now, perhaps you're thinking, well, that's ridiculous. What utter nonsense. Isn't this just taking this all too far? This is apocalyptic literature. It's bound to talk all dark and pessimistic towards the world today. Read too much of this, Steve, and you'll be wearing a sandwich board up and down Fremlin, Fremlin Walk with the end is nigh on it before long. No one else would see it, but there I'd be. But that is not true of apocalyptic literature. Biblical apoc apocalyptic is all for proclaiming human genuine hope. And it refuses to do so, though, by ignoring or denying the evil regimes that, that clutter up our human history. I mentioned a few weeks ago, 60 million murdered by the ideology that drove the Nazi regime. Shortly afterwards, Stalin, Stalin the grain quotas from the Ukrainians exceeding the total crop, 7 million starved to death. Idi Amin's carnage in Uganda, sledgehammering prisoners 
so that prison cells were littered with human eyes and teeth. Bring it closer to today, China, accused of committing genocide against the, the Ouija's. Reports, as well as, as the interning Ouija's in camps, China forcibly mass sterilizing Ouija women to suppress the population and separating Ouija children from their, from their families. And of course, these, these examples are not the exception. We don't have to look far to find cruelties perpetrated by Western democracies. Isn't the point that, that God is making through Daniel's dream that human history is quite literally beastly? It's scary. He wants us to hold a clear realism about life in this world. See, in this kind of literature, the point is that these are ungodly monsters cross over barriers of time and space. They run through centuries. Their common thread, they stand in opposition to God. They can be geopolitical institutions. They can stretch across geographical boundaries. There's, there's a real danger of being reductionist with apocalyptic literature. When I, uh, after I finished at uni, uh, I took a gap year where I, I backpacked around the world. Some of you will know that. And part of my time I spent in Israel. And one particular Sunday, I wanted to go to the Garden Tomb um, in Jerusalem um, for a service that they have there. It's, 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 it's archaeologically probably the site where Jesus was buried. So I made my way to, to Jerusalem uh, uh, the, the night before, the day before, Saturday. That was a challenge. And I checked in, well, I was checking into the youth hostel in Jerusalem. And the guy behind the desk asked me why, why I was coming to Jerusalem, why I wanted to be there. I explained about going to the service the next day. So he found out I was a Christian. And then he invited me to go into his cupboard under the stairs of the youth hostel. Now, by then, I had been traveling around the world for a while. I'd been in some fairly dodgy situations. I knew better than to follow some chap into his understair cupboard. So, but I did, I did go with him. I kept a foot in the door just in case things got awkward. And uh, this cupboard was, the walls were a mass of newspaper articles. And he proceeded to show me how this bit of news points to this bit of apocalyptic literature, which means that this is about to happen, which means that's about to happen. There is a real danger of reductionism with apocalyptic literature. What do you see in our world today that stands in opposition to God? Who do you read? What commentators, what influencers in society today? Whose values, whose ethics? With gods or against gods? How do you see the prevailing thinking in society today? An atheistic perspective will cite human potential and see an, an aggressive agenda that would oppose the values and beliefs of scripture as progressive. Sadly, even some who would identify as Christian will use that very language to move away from our biblical moorings. If you're a Christian, how do you feel about the values, the ideals of the world around? You see, I worry I don't see it nearly as graphically awful as this fourth beast. I worry that I'm actually too comfortable with the world. How comfortable are you with the ideological powers in play in our world today? Do you find their ethics appealing? Do you, do you think they've got a point when it challenges the plain teaching of God in, in his world? Is there something in this to spend time reflecting on maybe? If you'd not say you're a Christian, how do you feel about this description of human history to which you're aligning? Maybe you think, well, I... I'm saying I'm not saying that I'm aligning with that monist monster, that beast number four. Well, here's the thing. There doesn't appear to be a middle ground. Friends, I'm glad God has given me this very scary, very graphic description in Daniel seven to study this week. When God chipped in with this in the dinner party game, he may have put a damper on the joy of the evening. But think about it. Didn't we ought to be glad he did? If it would wake you and me up to the reality of what the human powers of this world look like, could he have done a more loving thing? 
But you see, us looking at the chapter in this way means I've let us miss something that God is doing in the text here. The eagle eyed among you will have noticed we've not read this in the order that God set out for us. As I said at the 830, I'm not sure eagle eyed is a good metaphor today, but but you know what I mean. You see, God keeps sandwiching this monster stuff with some blinding light, some reality that puts all of this monstrous vision in brilliant relief. In a moment, Joe will read the rest of the chapter for us. But let me whet your appetite with just a couple of verses to set it up. Look at the transition from verses eight to verse verse nine. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As he looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair on his head was was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were ablaze. Do you see, it's as if the text is saying, don't get overly anxious about this little horn thing. No, 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 look at this. Look what's coming next. It seems to me that's how the text is laid out. But before we get there, we're going to get serious about the challenge of this picture for us as Christians. How comfortable are you, Christian, with the powers in play in our world? Has God's description to us in Daniel's dream been an eye opener? This is how God sees it. How comfortable are you with this world? I wonder if there isn't something in this for us to bring in honest reflection before God. Here's what we'll do. We'll have a time just to reflect on that. Think about those ways that that you do all too easily fail to see the reality of the prevailing thinking of our age. The values that drive the so-called woke generation. The TV and its message we absorb, the very secular ethos, almost agenda of our media, most certainly the BBC. Do you just absorb or do you have your antennae up? Are you too much friends with beast number four? Underlying all of this are, of course, the spiritual forces of Satan and from whom they derive their power. Let's take a a few moments to reflect And then I'm going to lead us in a prayer. So let's just take a minute or so just to reflect. So I've put on the the screen, if you've got me uh, full screen, you'll see it more clearly, a confession prayer. A prayer for us to say, uh, perhaps on the back of what uh, what you've just been uh, thinking about. I'll say the prayer and then you can see at the bottom uh, it, there's an amen for us all to join in with. If you'd like to, to echo this prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, forgive me for those ways I've become too comfortable with the world, the many that are in the world. Forgive me, Lord, for when I don't see the dominant human power as you do, when it stands in opposition to you. Forgive me for being pulled so far away from you and back into the ways of the world. Deliver me, I pray, from any way I've become embroiled or have embraced or been influenced by the counter-Christian thinking of this age. Deliver me from this mindset that has swamped the heart of Christ from whom I gain such joy and peace. Thank you that even though I've proved so faithless, you have remained faithful and true. Cleanse me and wash me and renew a right spirit within me. And may I sing to your praise and glory until my life's end. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen. All creatures, even those those uh, visionary monsters in Daniel 7 are uh, are of course still under the lordship of God. So we're going to sing together now God's praises in the words of all creatures of our God and and King. Do stand if you like to as we sing together. Okay, the remaining verses from Daniel chapter 7. 
As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancients of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Thank you again, Joe. So my apologies, firstly, for splitting up the all given me. Joe and I were joking that... Uh, that I know better than God how to order his material, which is, of course, not true. I'd love to have had the time to first read the whole passage and then come back to it as we have. So here's what I'd love uh, for you to do. Will you do this? Well, as soon as you're able today, read again your way through, right through Daniel 7 in the order that God has given it to us. Please, please, will you do that? Doing as I have, we could easily miss that transition at verse 9 that I was talking about. It's abrupt. It's like you say, don't worry about the horn. Look at what's going to happen to it. Look at this. The whole structure is screaming at us not to be worrying about that little horn. It's boasting. Don't worry about it. It's going to be so easily dispatched. The sandwiching of the little horn and its beast between the ancient of days and the son of man is saying, look, the little horn is truly little. It's saying here's where the power and the glory and the justice and the kingship really sit. He's not that monster at all. In fact, if you are on the side of the monster, if you are uh, denying Christianity and, and that's where you want to stay, then you ought to find this middle section far more frightening than the Christian would find the first section we looked at. This middle section of Daniel's vision is nectar to God's oppressed people. The ancient of days holds court. The books are open. Judgment is made. Because of our cultural bias, we probably think advanced in days and we might think frail and old. The, the white hair, which actually res resembles or uh, perhaps grey hair, but represents blinding purity and righteousness. In the culture of the time, it was the opposite. It means he is grand, not frail. It's dignity, not senility that's in mind. The ancient, the idea is this ancient of days has been around a whole lot longer than these pathetic beasts. Then he takes his seat. The vision is of ordered, calm oversight. Whilst the human powers are frantic in activity, the ancient of days is calmly in control, never surprised by events, never undecided. The throne, fire, from the very first time we meet God, it's fire that signals his presence. When we find out his name in Exodus, when Moses meets him and find out he's called Yahweh, it's fire. But fire also signals judgment. The books are opened. Then there's the thousand serving stood before him. It's a picture of majesty. Then the son of man. 
In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Coming in clouds of heaven, that is always a reference to the arrival of God himself and about 70 passages in the Old Testament. So if this isn't a reference to a divine being, it is the only one in all 70. He's a divine being, but he is also like a son of man, human likeness, nothing like the beasts at all. Is that sounding a bit familiar, like somebody we might know? divine and human he's a royal figure given god's kingdom sounding even more, more like it well of course we're thinking jesus aren't we i hope we are jesus you see himself had no qualms in confessing his own identity from daniel 7 so we reach a climax in mark's knowledges that the whole gospel what, what, what the whole gospel has been laying out for 14 chapters. So when the high priest illegally placed Jesus under oath and demanded that he declare if he were the Messiah, the son of God, this is what Jesus replied. This is Mark 14. And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they condemned him as deserving death. Friends, we're very familiar with these verses, aren't we? And it's really easy to miss this moment's significance. Remember, this is the death sentence that brought about the ultimate sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That prompted his resurrection three days later, confirming that he is God on earth. Friends, that is pivotal, isn't it? Not only in Mark's gospel, not only in the Bible, but that is pivotal because it's true in all of human history. There is no more significant moment. God rescues humankind at that point. And at that pivotal moment, what does Jesus do? What is it that Jesus reaches for? Gloriously, he references Daniel chapter 7. At that pivotal moment in human history, Jesus quotes Daniel chapter 7. The high priest didn't miss it, did he? He knew what Jesus was referring to. Jesus claimed to be the one that the Ancient of Days hands the kingdom to. Friends, if you're not a Christian, you're aligned to the little horn. You're not on the side of the ancient of days. I really can't see a place for polite indifference in this chapter. Can you? I plead with you, consider this vision of God. Consider the claim of Jesus Christ as his death sentence is pronounced. If you've not made your mind up about Christ, please, please get busy with that. If you are a Christian, these verses are here in their time to encourage God's beleaguered people in exile. The little horn is barely introduced before it's quickly dispatched. Like Daniel, we're confused by this little horn thing. Did you notice Daniel kept wanting to know more? He was disturbed by it. I want to know more. I want to understand it. But the text says forget about that. Know this about the ancient of days. Focus on the son of man. The majestic judge, the reigning king, hasn't lost any of, its, of his sovereignty to the monsters of, of those human powers. Friends, I can't better this summary. Seeing this secret behind history may not keep God's people from pain, but it should keep them from panic. We may still be fearful but should not be frantic. Seeing this secret behind history may not keep God's people from pain, but should keep them from panic. We may still be fearful, 
but should not be frantic.